I like how you're button mashing. We'll be talking about that <laughs> briefly. So that's good. Thank you very much for your help. And you guys keep your badges. You can uh, have a little souvenir of the talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, just give yours away because you're a loser. Let's right now. Yeah, thank you for all the volunteers. Yeah. So hopefully that wasn't too uncompelling, but uh, that's pretty much what we saw all weekend. That was exactly what it was like being there. Not really. <laughs> so, like I said, the attacks for the uh, humans and zombies did one to five damage, depending on the mode, depending on things. It actually went up to double that if they had certain other conditions. The uh, humans started out with 500 health, so they'd have to take, get hit 500 times, and they also had to have defense. They had other ways to defend themselves against it, too. So it took a while to kill somebody. Zombies had less health, but as I mentioned, if you button mashed on it, you could come back to life, so their health kind of didn't matter. Um, after, uh, and the clerics, like I said, they healed 20, 20 health at a time, which was terrible. Um, this is an influence of me having played a lot of World of Warcraft back in the day where nobody wants to heal, so I figured nobody would want to heal at a conference either. There you go, that's my priest over there. Um, so this was kind of unfortunate. We should have made this much lower because there were actually people in the vendor area tweeting saying, hey, you low on health? Come over to our vendor booth and we'll, we'll heal you up. <laughs> Which is great advertisement. It's a way to get people to your booth, but uh, it kind of impacted the game where a lot of people didn't die like we wanted them to because I was definitely on the side of the zombies for this. So that was pretty interesting. And there was also another badge, which I don't have a demo of here, but it ran in god mode where I could turn people into any mode they wanted. Uh, me and one other person had the god mode badge because we didn't want that getting out too much. But in the end of the day, it ended up being a prize if you're able to hack your badge properly and uh, get to this mode. Um, this was really fun to play with, actually, because once I noticed the uh, healers were having a little too much fun healing and advertising on Twitter and getting really upset if uh, people were trying to attack them, where they would be physically running away from people, although that doesn't matter, guys, <laughs> unless you're really, really fast. Um, I had one point where I was intent on getting uh, Dan Kaminsky, who was very happy to be a healer and very upset if people were coming after him, uh, following him around trying to turn him into anything but a healer, but unfortunately didn't work, and there's reasons why. So when we roll all this out, we made a few predictions. Okay, what are we going to see people doing with this? What's the kind of stuff they're going to want to do to really mess with us? Well, the first thing I figured, well, all the packets, we didn't, those were unencrypted, but all our packets were encrypted. And we chose intentionally bad, quote unquote, encryption. So people would actually crack this and not really have the whole weekend spent saying, oh, I don't know what's going on, or just doing a simple replay attack or something like that. Uh, but we did expect that kind of stuff. We didn't expect, expect replay attacks, especially if they crack the encryption, we expect them to actually totally own the game, which a few people did. Um, we expected hardware hacks, people putting like a 555 timer hooked up to their uh, attacking button and just constantly auto attacking the whole weekend long. We uh, didn't really want that to happen, but it was certainly a possibility at, to a point. And then we knew people would do things we never expected, and boy did we miss the mark on some of them. So on April 23rd, we opened up the con at 5 p.m., started distributing the badges. We went with a, uh, about 65% human badges distributed, 30% zombie, the rest for everybody else. And the first day went pretty much as planned. The humans, there were just so many of them, they didn't really care what was going on. They'd hit buttons, they wouldn't see anything happen. So they just said, oh, this is great, I'm gonna go enjoy, have a drink, and see what's going on. The zombies saw things happening, and they were very excited because there were way more humans than there were zombies. So they went on the attack and really tried to get a foothold of more zombies in place than humans. So, and I was certainly encouraging this to telling everybody who could attack as a zombie to definitely attack as a zombie because the humans needed to die. So, I mean, they did. So the first day, Friday night, really went as planned. It was a lot of fun. We'll see the data in just a moment here. But on the second day, as soon as people woke up and had some time to play with things, really strange things started happening in the data. Now, this graph here, I apologize if you can't quite see the top of it, is what we saw. The, uh, on the very left-hand side, you see, I apologize for if it's hard to read, but the very left-hand side, the big spike you see there are the zombies, and those are the people, like I was saying, get everybody, all the zombies need to attack. The humans were attacking a little bit. They were there, but they didn't attack anywhere near the volume of the zombies that they did. The next day, however, if you notice, all four colors on this graph spiked all the way to the top, and they did a little bit later on in the day, well, that evening, too. So I looked at this data when I first saw it, and I'm like, this is really strange. Why would we have all these attacks like that? So we had to go through the data, dig through and investigate, and we came up with a lot of interesting results, which I'll get to in a few slides here. Um, I already covered that. So one of the things we did see were hardware hacks. 
we saw a lot of neat uh, people trying to do things with a badge to affect the game directly, which I thought was great. Unfortunately, outside of uh, predicting that people were going to use like timers to automate their attacks, we didn't really provide any good ways to use the hardware to, uh, to influence the game directly. And we actually wrote into the firmware a uh, uh, timeout so they wouldn't actually be able to automate their attacks because we didn't want people just flooding the network full of packets all weekend long. That was no good. That, that would really uh, be detrimental to the quality of service, so to speak. Um, so we rate limited all the attacks. Nobody was able to do anything about that. And some people tried. Other people, this also prevented people from mashing the buttons like we saw one of the volunteers doing while he was up here, where it really didn't matter. You could only attack once every five seconds. And uh, so people had a lot of sore thumbs as a result for no good reason. Uh, the buttons were not very friendly on the thumbs. But this was great because it stopped many of the automated attacks we saw and everybody just, we didn't tell anyone so we had a lot of fun laughing at people the whole time. So there were some moderately successful attacks depending on how you define success. Um, the, probably the most, Im the most impactful event that happened was one guy had a fuzzer. He just took some of the sample code we had, um, said, well, I'm just going to throw random junk out there. I know how big these packets are. I'm going to throw random data and see what happens. And uh, it wasn't entirely predicted by us. And we didn't really think someone was going to actually flood the network as much as they could the entire weekend long to essentially shut down the game in a few ways, which was quite unfortunate. Um, he made people's badges were changing modes right, really, and doing really strange things as a result, things we didn't really predict. And this essentially just turned into a giant denial of service attack on the conference for the entire weekend. Um, this, the badges just did not know how to handle this. We didn't do anything smart like check summing on the badges, so that was really a poor call on our part because every, every packet was essentially valid. And this really confused the attendees and myself for quite a bit. Um, we, so we collected about 30 megs of logs, which was the data you just saw on the screen there. So 30 megs of just those, what, 10 or so characters is a lot of data. Um, out of the attacks we saw, we saw 39,000 and change successful attacks. And this includes a fuzzed attacks and other auto, automatically replayed attacks that were uh, of, the, of a valid type, but we didn't really differentiate them from, we couldn't differentiate them from what was actually fuzzed. And then we saw one and a half million fuzzed attacks. So the, guy who, the people who are doing this kind of stuff, they were just firing out packets as fast as possible and really, really messing things up. Um, it was a lot of fun to see it afterwards in the data, though. What we have in the screenshot there is an example of what they were doing. The uh, third column there is the actual attack type. The valid types were 1 through 4 and 99 for the god mode. Uh, none of these were valid. The, all the data here was clearly just being randomly generated. And this had just such a devastating effect on the badges. It was uh, fun to a point. <laughs> so. Fuzzing aside, people did similar things with packet replay, which was very successful. Uh, there were at least two people I know that were at the conference that actually figured everything out, started replaying, uh, started replaying packets, and just started impacting the game however they wanted. This was great if you want to have an automated attack. You just have to make a custom firmware, which was very easy to do with the samples. Start replaying a, a captured packet that you saw that you knew was a valid attack, and just go to town on it. And it worked really, really well for them. Uh, this got around the late, rate, yeah, excuse me, the rate limiting uh, code we put in place because at this point it's your code. You, don't, you didn't really have to apply to ours at this point. Um, and some people actually did this with the to replaying by just generating a. Excuse, just generating uh, some random data in there, but using the proper format and inferring what was going on by watching other packets. And they, they actually accessed the God mode packet these ways. Um, but they didn't really understand what was going on. They just were replaying what they saw and replaying it a bunch of times and seeing everybody's batch freak out. So the way that this got a lot better was when they cracked encryption. Now we use this very, very high tech thing called XOR. Um, <laughs> if we did this intentionally because we wanted to make it fun, um, if the one line there is just a sample of what a packet looked like raw. The uh, first byte there, actually the second, the second byte in this line, um, is the XOR key itself. So every packet that went out, we had the key in it. So this made it pretty easy to figure out what was going on. And then the second and third bytes there were the packet type and the, uh, the power of the attack, or just looking at the other parameters to pass through for the function. And the rest of it, like I said earlier, was junk. Once people started cracking this, the whole game opened up. Everybody just started seeing, okay, what can I send through now? What will work? I know I can send valid packets of any type I want. Let's see what happens. And uh, this is where people started having a whole lot of fun. Um, another way people did have some really good luck was by brute forcing as well. Uh, especially once the encryption was broken, they, we were seeing people just going through, trying everything they could to figure out what was going on. And they essentially mapped out the entire protocol this way. Uh, especially if they were in closed quarters without a not a lot of other people around. They could see the direct actions of what they were doing on other people's badges. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we had a, 
uh, excuse me. So we had a few obvious attempts of what was going on here. I'll show that right here. This was clearly one person, or maybe multiple people, I'm not exactly sure because we just collected the data randomly. Um, collecting or just trying anything they could. They started replaying the same numbers through the different power fields here. Um, this may have had an effect if they weren't using zero as the packet type that was not that was an unused value. So this was pretty interesting where people are just firing away at crazy trying to see what they could make it do. And then someone smartened up here and said, it's probably awfully hard to read, but they just went through and iterated through every kind of packet there was to see what would happen. Trying it first in the packet type column, which they didn't know at the time of this. They just tried one column at a time. Then again at the packet power column. Um, this was really smart. This actually was pretty close to actually breaking the entire protocol for the game and figuring out what was going on. Uh, except for the part that having zero as the other value would essentially make all the attacks be of zero power, which obviously won't hurt anything. Oh, and then like I said in the slide previous, the attack type of zero, so that didn't do anything either. So whoever this was was just a hair away from cracking everything that was going on, and but just didn't quite have it. So unfortunate for him. Um, but this is definitely the way that people were going through and thinking about how to attack this, trying to crack what was going on in these packets, figure out what was going on. And uh, ultimately people were figuring this out, people were generating any kind of packet they wanted out of their badge. Uh, and including the god mode stuff which was letting people walk around and just nuke entire rooms and turn them into any kind of thing they want, even make them all dead, which was a lot of fun for everybody. So that was definitely the grand prize for the badge hacking that was going on. So we learned a lot of things from this here. Um, one thing we learned is when you're playing around with something, especially something small scale like this in a confined area with people who know what they're doing, you really have to prepare for denial of service attacks. Uh, they they really ruined us for the game. It essentially every time that one guy would walk into the room, when one guy knew who was doing it, walked into the room, the room pretty much shut down. The game wasn't in action for a bit. If, uh, actually I think I lost a slide here, but we go back to this. So the big spikes we have here, uh, the ones where all the colors are going up the same, that was when this one guy would walk into a room with his badge that was constantly fuzzing. Um, because of that, when everything shut down, things were just going nuts and you can tell when he went to like, went out for the night to check out Providence uh, when he came back to the hotel around midnight. Um, so this guy was a walking denial of service attack. So that really sucked. We got to make sure we do something about that next year. Uh, the one thing we really need to do is put checksums on the packets. Maybe we were using a lot of just really fake packets. They weren't really valid Zigbee packets or anything at all, but it was really just what we got to work in the three weeks we worked on it. Um, it would be a little nice if we made something so it check for a valid packet, make sure replay attacks don't work, and make sure fuzzing doesn't work in the future. But it's nice, it's kind of fun to track people at the same time, so that worked out pretty cool. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the one thing that was cool about XOR encryption was it was almost good enough for the conference. We wanted to last about 24 hours from when the first badges went out. So people would have to work on it off and on for a day, and then actually have something that they could play with. Uh, based on the data we saw, people started really doing strange things and really started doing what looked like brute force attacks after about 18 hours. So I don't know, I guess that's if you take a sample of 250 people, someone will crack XOR encryption 18 hours. So I wouldn't quote me on that metric, but I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and one thing we need to do definitely next year is incorporate more hardware hacks into the game. Uh, this was probably one of the more complicated parts of it. Shutting down the 555 timer uh, attack approach was really unfortunate, especially since somebody tried it and because only one person tried it. Um, where it would be nice to have some way to influence it that way. That's definitely something we thought would make the game a lot better for next year and really improve upon things quite a bit. So, but at the same time, a lot of people had fun with the hardware. It's a really fun platform to work with, really easy to, uh, add things on to. Um, it has a lot of extra GPIO pins so you can just start putting things on it like you would in anything else. Uh, really fun. I would really recommend checking out this uh, whole hardware platform and doing what you can. So I have a little conclusion here, but not the finale so to speak. Um, in the end, the humans did win, mostly because the zombies couldn't do anything about it. Um, so that was unfortunate, but that was the reality of what we saw. And we love it just the same because people had a lot more fun with it that way. Having Zigbee involved in badges like this is a whole lot of fun. If anybody's trying to come up with an idea for their own conference, their own whatever function, they need to have some sort of ID, I'd really advise checking it out. This chip here is in about the $15 range for, uh, uh, for the chip itself. So you might be able to whip up something pretty low price using, we didn't have anything, anything really fancy here, an integrated antenna onto the board and a few other components. So you could probably do this even cheaper if you really tried. 
um, but it was a whole lot of fun. And people really, really love messing 